It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. Uh, and it's the, in the context of the fact that the people of Ontario are exhausted from battling COVID-19. Uh, and what we've learned from all of the experts is the successful way uh, to avoid a catastrophic third wave uh, is to be very careful and slow, for example, with the reopening of our province. Uh, another piece of advice that was really clear from the experts is that the public health measures to protect people need to be increased. And of course, then there's always the vaccinations that are coming down the pike. But, Speaker, when public health units and doctors and hospitals are all saying that the uh, government has been rushing the reopening, all the Premier has to say in response is that not to worry. There's an emergency break in place that they can rely on should something go wrong. Well, Speaker, that was announced a couple of weeks ago. We have no idea to this day what were the, would be the criteria Question. for the implementation or utilization of that emergency break? Perhaps the Premier can shed some light this morning. Thank you. Respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, the, what we have today is not a reopening of Ontario. It is a transition back into the framework that we had before. Exactly. We're taking this very slowly and cautiously because we know of the variants of concern that are out there, both the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, and I'm sure that there will be others. But the emergency break has been applied, and it's applied on the basis of the number of cases that are out there, the ability of public health to be able to respond in a timely manner, the ability of our hospitals to be able to deal with people with COVID and with other issues, and the level of variance. And we've seen the break be applied even this past week with having both Peel and Toronto remain with the stay-at-home orders because of the variance and other issues that they're trying to deal with, as well as in North Bay, which otherwise would have been in green, but because of the variance of concern and the concern about them escalating, Response. has remained at the stay-at-home order for the safety of the people in the North Bay area. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I'm not sure if the Minister of Health noticed the news last night, but people are flocking to the malls in places like York Region. It seems to me that the message the government's trying to send is really not getting through. Most experts have actually said that by the time the government gets to implementing an emergency break, it'll be far too late. Fearfully, that's what might be happening as we speak. In fact, Dr. Michael Warner said this. Quote, instead of waiting until we have a critical number of people vaccinated first, the Ontario government has jumped the gun because they have not put in place proper measures to pre prevent the spread of COVID-19. When you see people flocking to the mall speaker, when you see the fact that our caseloads are no longer falling, the question that we have for the government is this, this claim of, of caution is not question. holding water. Why is this government jumping the gun when it comes to the opening of, of our province? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition, it should come to us. It's no surprise to you that I vigorously disagree with what you're saying, okay. that we are seeing the numbers coming down, but we recognize with the variance of concern, they can go back up again exponentially. So that is something that is being very carefully watched by Dr. Williams, by the Public Health Measures Table, which includes a number of the local medical officers of health from across Ontario. They will not hesitate to use the emergency break again if they need to, and this is being very carefully watched in York as well as in every other part of Ontario. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know the other thing that uh, that has been uh, indicated by most experts in terms of uh, avoiding a catastrophic third wave are the fact that more public health measures need to be put in place, and yet this government is refusing to do so. Measures uh, like, for example, uh, an eviction ban for, uh, for tenants. Uh, measures uh, like, for example, reducing class sizes to 15 in the schools. And measures like paid sick days. And yet none of these measures are being seriously considered by this government nor implemented. So the question then is, when Dr. Williams even Dr. Williams says he favours the idea of paid sick days. Why is our Premier stubbornly refusing to implement them? The Minister of Labour. 
training and skills development? Well, Mr. Speaker, the very first uh, initiative that our government undertook was to bring in job-protected leave for every single worker in this province. If you're home because of COVID-19 and self-isolation and quarantine, if you're home looking after a son or a daughter because of the disruption uh, in the school system, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, and the member opposite should know, we eliminated the need for sick notes during COVID-19. But Mr. Speaker, the thing that the Leader of the Opposition is failing to mention to working women and men across the province is that there is one month of paid sick days for every single worker in this province. We need to raise awareness of Order. that program, and it's a disservice to every woman and man that's working in the province of Ontario that the Leader of the Opposition and the NDP don't make them aware of that program. Question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Next question is also for the Premier. Uh, the disservice is in not recognizing, however, Speaker, that paid sick days are a requirement if people are going to do the right thing and stay home when they're feeling sick. <laughs> Having said that, you know, the other people that are in a, a, in a very bad situation now are seniors who are really concerned about when they're going to get their uh, vaccine. They're worried and they need information. In fact, even family doctors are worried and they need information. They're saying that the government is uh, being confused in its communication around the vaccine rollout. In fact, Dr. Michelle Cohen says this, and I quote, when patients call my office anxiously looking to get on a vaccination list because the government told them their family doctor would soon be calling, I will have nothing to offer them but frustration. Creating confusion makes it easier for the government to evade accountability. So my question to the Premier is, question. what what is happening here? Is this uh, physician and other physicians correct in saying that the government's aim here is to evade accountability? And if not, why is there such, such confusion around the vaccine? Again, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, the aim here is to be clear and transparent with the people of Ontario about the vaccination rollout, as we have thus far. But the reality is that each of the 34 public health units have been asked to develop their own plan and submit them to the vaccination task force, because what is relevant in one part of Ontario in terms of doing vaccines in uh, a rural area may be going to your family doctor. In an urban area, it may be going to a mass vaccination clinic. There are many different ways that this is going to be rolled out, and this is going to be made clear to the people of Ontario uh, in a very short while how they can do that. So they can do it by contacting their family doctor. In many cases, they can do it online. Many people may not feel comfortable doing that. They can also call a centre to book their appointment. So this is going to be specific and clear to the people and is going to be produced within a very short time. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I think everybody knows that part of avoiding a catastrophic third wave is a successful uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, however, you know, the, it's really clear that before this uh, pandemic hit, uh, our Premier was not all that confident in our public health units. Uh, and now, of course, we are in a situation where we're going to be relying on them, and I think importantly, because I actually do have confidence in them, uh, with the planning and distribution of the vaccines, contacting people uh, at the administration, all of this will be done by public health units. The same ones that the Ford government was cutting and trying to amalgamate with forced mergers uh, before the pandemic hit. In fact, in 2019, the Premier said all they know how to do, referring to public health units, and I'm quoting, is tax people and spend their money, wow. not drive efficiency. So, I, my question is, has the Premier all of a sudden had a change of question. heart? Does he suddenly respect public health units, and will he provide the support that they need to successfully vaccinate everyone in Ontario? Minister of Health. Thank you. In fact, we have every confidence in our public health units. They have done a spectacular job during the course of this entire pandemic. From the very beginning, in terms of increasing case and contact management, in terms of being in touch with families, in terms of being in touch with individuals, um, in some cases issuing their own Section 22 orders where they feel that there are measures in their own particular area that need to be further protected. But I would also, again, through you, Mr. Speaker, remind the Leader of the Official Opposition that our public health units have been implementing our flu vaccines for many years and this year implemented our biggest flu vaccine in our our history with over six Order. million vaccines being uh, given to people of Ontario, with more to come. So I have every confidence that our public health units have the knowledge and the experience Response. to drive a very successful COVID vaccine campaign. 
Order. The final supplementary. Well, curious that this government has had such a change of heart when it comes to public health units. Let's hope that it stays that way, Speaker. But the bottom line is it's, it's clear that the government has not undertaken the measures needed to ensure that the uh, province is not plunged back into a, a third wave that's devastating and catastrophic. Uh, we clearly don't see a reopening that has been slow enough or careful enough to say all the public health health experts. We clearly don't see ex uh, increased measures like paid sick days, for example, uh, and a ban on evictions and slower class sizes. We clearly have a confusing vaccine rollout uh, that, uh, that the government is you know, creating confusion around and chaos around. So I, I guess the, the question that I have is, you know, how can we guarantee that all of those seniors who are worried about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic resurging, how can we guarantee them that this government Question. has it together enough to stop a third wave from occurring. And the Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it'll be very simple to do that because we're going to roll out a clear and transparent plan within the next very short while. We, uh, and people will know Order. when and how they will be able to get the vaccines. In some cases, people will be able to do it themselves Order. online. In some cases, they will need to have their family members help them. In some cases, they'll be able to call. Some of the public health units may have their contact information. In other situations, they're going to be working with the family doctors in order to make sure that they can receive the information about when and where to come in. But we will be ready when we receive the vaccines, which we don't have in great quantities right now, but when we receive them, we'll be able to triple or quadruple the number of vaccines we can do in a single day. We are ready for it, and the people of Ontario can count on that. All of our seniors will get the shot if they wish to have one. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, parents and education workers are counting on this government to keep students safe and schools safely open. We know from the experts that in order to do that, we need a broad, asymptomatic, and truly accessible testing program. But despite a commitment to conduct up to 50,000 tests a week, the ministry is reporting just 3,706 tests completed since late January. In what's become the practice of this government, school boards are scrambling to establish testing systems after being given just days to prepare. In the meantime, the number of schools closed due to the outbreak doubled since last week. Speaker, where are the promised safety enhancements in schools, and when will we see a truly comprehensive in-school testing plan that matches the scale of this pandemic? To reply, the Minister of Education. Well, a very interesting admission from the education critic that under the NDP plan, they would mandate compulsory testing on parents, students, and staff, unlike any jurisdiction in the world. In this province, Speaker, Order. we are providing voluntary choice to parents, but yes, we're making it accessible, more convenient, and local. That's why we've stepped up the testing capacity. The Minister of Health through Ontario Health has already provided symptomatic and asymptomatic testing to public health units throughout this entire pandemic, certainly since September to the present. But in the Ministry of Education, given the variance of concern, given the new challenges we face as a province and country, we have expanded capacity. In asymptomatic testing programs that were unveiled as recently as yesterday, the average rate of positivity in Toronto, in Peel, in Hamilton, Ottawa and Sudbury is 0.8%, 86%. Demonstrating, I believe, that the rate of transmission runs low, but underscores the necessity to keep our vigilance up to keep our kids safe. A supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, they're slow walking testing in this province. It's outrageous. Speaker, it's not just parents and education workers asking these questions. People for Education released preliminary results of their annual school survey today, and it paints a very bleak picture of overworked school administrators trying to keep up with constantly changing directives without the resources and the support they need. 73 per cent of principals responding to the survey ranked enforcing physical distancing as a top concern. One said, and I'll quote, it is impossible to keep students socially distanced. I have class sizes of 24 to 27 students and can't possibly sp space them out to eat at lunchtime. Speaker, through you to the Premier, if the goal is to keep schools safely open long term, why are we still seeing up to 30 kids crammed into classrooms in this province? And the Minister of Education respond. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a once in a generation crisis that our province is uh, standing up to make sure that our schools remain safe and that our schools remain open. That is a position that is a contrasting one in this legislature. There are 
two parties in this House that would rather our schools be closed. It was the words of the member opposite a month ago when community transmission was around two to 3,000 that said it, we didn't have to have it this way when schools were closed, which thus would conclude you'd keep them, you'd keep them open at a time of community transmission of 3,000 cases a day. We have cautiously, Order. against, against, the, against Order. the position of the opposition leader, we have cautiously reopened the schools. We're actually the only province speaker in the nation that cautiously Order. reopened, waiting till those rates got down while we expand capacity for testing, enhance our, 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 enhance our uh, requirement for screening before a child enters a school, Response. and of course, mandated masking all the way down to grade one with a better quality mask. This government is on the side of parents, we're on the side of teachers. We're going to keep our schools open. <laughs> I'm going to ask the member for Davenport and the member for Waterloo to come to order. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. As we continue our fight against COVID-19, I know it's critical that we all continue to follow public health advice until more vaccines arrive, as this is our best and only defense against the virus. While I know the delay in shipments of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine had affected our government's initial rollout, we still managed to offer the first doses of vaccine to all long-term care residents across the province. As we continue to receive more vaccine doses from the federal government, would the minister please update this House on our government's progress in the rollout of these vital vaccines? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Flamborough. Landbrook for your question and for your advocacy ongoing. Let me be clear, our government is committed to having one of the most effective COVID-19 immunization campaigns in the country. And we are well on our way to achieving this goal by having recently administered over 575,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccines in phase one priority populations throughout the province. This was done even after the unexpected reduction in supply coming to us from the federal government. Our government swiftly acted by making critical adjustments to our vaccination plan to ensure the most vulnerable, like those in long-term care, receive the vaccine as quickly as possible. As we receive more shipments of the vaccine from the federal government, we are looking forward to continuing to expand our vaccination rollout to include even Response. more variants. Thank you. The supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to all of the frontline workers for helping us administer these crucial vaccines. As our government builds on this early success, I know constituents in my riding can take comfort in the fact that this government is working tirelessly to ensure as many Ontarians as possible are vaccinated as quickly as possible, pending the availability of supplies. It's important for Ontarians to know that this is only the first phase of our province's rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, and as more vaccines get approved and the supply increases, so will the number of people receiving the vaccines. Can the minister inform the members of this House how our government plans to build off these early successes in our vaccine rollout? Minister of Health. Yes, and thank you. Building from some of the early successes our government has achieved, even with a limited supply of vaccines, we are continuing to expand our capacity and ramp up efforts for phase two of our vaccination rollout, which is expected to begin this April. This will be done by working collaboratively with local public health units who have developed plans to operate mass immunization clinics as soon as enough supply becomes available, as well as continuing to offer mobile clinics to vaccinate our most vulnerable. Additionally, an online booking system will be implemented in order to further support this next phase of the vaccination rollout, and a customer service desk will also be made available to those who are unable to book an appointment through the online tool. Our government will stop at nothing as we continue to implement Response. the most comprehensive vaccination campaign in the country. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I asked this government to come clean and tell Ontarians which developer is lined up for the sweetheart deal to buy the Dominion Wheel and Foundries buildings in my riding in Toronto Centre. 
This government's response was about as clear as mud, Speaker. First, the minister told us that the site isn't being sold to anyone and there's no sale of the property. But hours later, the Premier said the deal hasn't been signed 100 per cent yet and that the process is moving forward. So which is it? Speaker, why is this government re refusing to tell us who in the Premier's inner circle is getting dibs on the purchase of the Foundry Buildings in Toronto Centre? Please stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. I think the government side would expect me to listen carefully to what the opposition member has to say. And if she says anything unparliamentary, I think the government side would expect me to be on my feet. It makes it harder for me to listen when there's heckling from the government side when one of the opposition is asking a question. Very same thing the other way. Start the clock. Next question, or response, the member for Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will remind this House one more time that the site has not been sold. Speaker, our government is leveraging a vacant, provincially owned property to build a new affordable housing and community space. Our government completed a heritage impact assessment for the site, and it determined that the building requires demolition to allow for environmental remediation. Order. Speaker, it's astonishing that the members opposite is against environmental remediation and affordable, much, much needed affordable housing in the city of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. Now I will say the same thing to the opposition side. <laughs> when there's a government minister answering a question, you would expect me to listen carefully, and if the member says anything inappropriate or outside the rules, you'd expect me to be on my feet. It's harder for me to listen carefully and intently when there's heckling from the other side. So I'd ask you to consider that too. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Once again, this government is putting political favours for their developer friends ahead of people. This government has brokered a special deal with one developer for the heritage-listed foundry buildings, without any other bidders and without actually listing the property for sale in an open, fair and competitive process. They didn't even bother to notify the city. My community has had enough of this, of this government's contradictory statements and vague talking points. We want answers. Who is being offered the deal behind closed doors? How much are they paying? And how much have they donated to the Ontario PC party for that right? You can ask the member to withdraw. withdraw. The response, the member for Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear that the negotiating mandate to facilitate the future sale of the site has been approved. However, the site has not been sold. We are currently consulting with the community to hear more from them. We also have an ongoing conversation Order. with Mayor Tory, and the ministry staff is also having an ongoing conversation with the city staff. We look forward to completing our public consultation and moving forward with the environmental remediation of this site. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Sorry, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, somebody that can answer. Ministerial zoning orders are directives that allow the minister to decide how a parcel of land can be used, overriding local planning and existing zoning rules. While these directives can sometimes be justified, they should be used sparingly as to not regularly deny Ontarians the opportunity to voice concerns or appeal. This is especially important when the projects raise environmental concerns. In the 15 years before 2018, only 16 of these orders were issued. Yet, suddenly, mm -hmm. this government has issued 37 over two years, and 32 of those were issued last year alone. We've seen decisions over the last two years that have further reduced environmental protections, and I worry that these orders are being issued with the same lack of concern. How Question. can the minister justify issuing so many MZOs when we know they should be used sparingly as to override, as not to not override important planning processes? The response, the member for Milton and parliamentary system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government has been crystal clear that every single ministerial zoning order issued on non-provincially owned lands has been at the request of the local municipality, full stop. MZOs are a tool our government uses to get critical 
local projects that people rely on located outside of the green belt moving faster. Mr. Speaker, let me list some of the projects the member opposite has opposed. The creation of 3,700 long-term care beds, nearly 1,000 affordable homes and hundreds of supportive housing units, 26,000 new jobs, the expansion of a Sunnybrook Hospital, a made in Ontario PPE facility, and Mr. Speaker, I can go on and on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, 14 ministerial orders were issued to push through projects where environmental concerns have been raised. We can understand the use of these orders to approve projects for much-needed long-term care beds, producing urgently needed medical supplies and other similar cases, as the minister pointed out. However, when the government uses these exceptional power under the guise of recovery measure from the pandemic, to allow for the destruction of protected wetlands, endangered species, or important agricultural land, it may be of the interest of some developers, but it is certainly not in the public interest. Economic recovery is important, but not at the cost of the future generations who will have to grapple with the impact of these decisions. If MZOs are meant to be used for fast-track, urgent infrastructure Question. needs, can the minister explain how using them to approve building projects such as market price housing in a film studio crucial to our COVID-19 recovery? Member for Milton. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ministerial zoning orders are not new. In fact, they have been used since 1972. The previous Liberal government issued 19 MZOs, Mr. Speaker. One difference between our government and the previous Liberal government is that Liberals built only 600 long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker, compared to the 3,600 long-term care beds that our government has built by issuing these much-needed MZOs to help communities right across this province. And we will not apologize for that, Mr. Speaker. Okay. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glenbrook. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Solicitor General. I was pleased to see that yesterday the government introduced the Combating Human Trafficking Act. This fulfills a key commitment by the Premier during last year's announcement of Ontario's five-year anti-human trafficking strategy, that Ontario would take a hard look at legislative options available to combat this heinous crime. I know that all members of this House agree that human trafficking has absolutely no place in communities across this province. But, Speaker, I'm sure that this is no easy feat, given Ontario has the most reported incidents of human trafficking in the country. Can the House receive more details on how specifically this legislation will help hold offenders accountable so that those who perpetrate this heinous crime face justice? The Solicitor General to reply. Thank you, and thank you to the member from uh, Flamborough Glenbrook for her interest and advocacy in our anti human trafficking strategy. You know, Speaker, our young people are at greatest risk for being exploited by traffickers. We've said it before, but it bears repeating. The average age of recruitment is only 13 years old. Because of the strong foundation laid by our colleague, the, the uh, Minister Laurie Scott, while we were in opposition, we have been able to provide a government-wide, comprehensive approach to dealing with human trafficking in the province of Ontario. So if passed, this legislation would provide police service with the authority to access motel, hotel, and short-term rental guest registration information with the penalty of non-compliance of $5,000. It will require companies that advertise sexual services to have a contact for law enforcement to request information as part of a human trafficking investigation. These are government-wide, ministry-wide proposals that are going to make a real difference in our community and for our young people. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, it is reassuring to hear the Solicitor General highlight how the proposed legislation would provide new tools to more effectively hold offenders accountable. But these tools can only work if police are well resourced to take on traffickers. And I've heard the Solicitor General say that criminals don't respect municipal boundaries. And I have no doubt that this is especially true when it comes to human traffickers. 
Moreover, our increasingly digital world has made trafficking even more complex, with traffickers able to rely on new forms of communication to identify potential victims and to evade detection. My question, again, to the Solicitor General. Can you identify what resources police have to fight the perpetrators of this heinous crime? Again, the Solicitor General. Well, the member is absolutely right. You know, human trafficking investigations can often be complex, spanning across multiple jurisdictions and, unfortunately, over many years, which is why a new intelligence-led joint forces investigation team was established, bringing together police agencies from across Ontario, including the OPP, municipal police services, and First Nations Police Services. The capacity of the OPP Child Sexual Exploitation Unit is also being expanded by adding an additional 23 officers. Police services are also enhancing the use of major case management for human trafficking by investing in software development. You know, I think if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's our reliance on digital and the fact that our children and our young people are spending more and more time online. And frankly, the traffickers have used this as an exploitation pathway. So these initiatives are already seeing with results with a number of joint operations uh, resulting in traffickers being charged last year and into January. January. Thank you, Speaker. For London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier likes to claim that he's the reason the federal sickness benefit program exists. <laughs> but when the program was first proposed, the Premier's response was blunt and clear. He told everyone, and I quote, I don't support it, even though it would be temporary and even though it would be funded entirely by the federal government. Speaker, why does the Premier think he deserves credit for a program that he fought against from the beginning? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've uh, worked every single day, Mr. Speaker, to protect the health and safety of every single worker in this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the very first initiative we brought forward in this legislature, supported by all members of this party, was to bring in legislation to protect jobs. If any worker is home in self-isolation, in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad who has to stay home and look after a son or a daughter because of the uh, school closures, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, we eliminated the need for sick notes. But Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Premier of Ontario, all provincial and territorial leaders, they worked together with the federal government to deliver $1.1 billion worth of paid sick days uh, to workers in this province and to all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to report today that over 110,000 workers here in Ontario are either receiving benefit Spons? or have applied for benefits. We're going to continue to advocate on behalf of workers to bring improvements to this program. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The minister should know that unpaid leave isn't going to help workers pay the bills and pay the rent. <laughs> Speaker, if it wasn't for the federal government coming to the table in the first place and for the other premiers, like the Premier of BC, who fought back against this premier's refusal to support workers, Ontario workers wouldn't have even the limited and inadequate federal sick benefits they can apply for now. Last week, this premier said he doesn't want provincial paid sick days because he thinks that investing in Ontarians is a waste of money. Speaker, why is this government so focused on preventing Ontario workers from getting the paid sick days they deserve. And the response, the Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, there's still $800 million left uh, in the bank account uh, through this federal program. We're going to continue to advocate on behalf of workers. Mr. Speaker, that's why I've worked really, really closely with Minister Qualtrough, the federal minister who's responsible for this program. We've worked together to raise awareness uh, of this program, Order. to also push for faster Order. payments. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 80 percent of the sick day pay is now being directly deposited into Ontario workers' bank accounts within three to five days. That's good news for workers. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, uh, thanks to our advocacy on behalf of workers, uh, the federal program is now uh, one month of paid sick days. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the member opposite. Uh, one of the NDP members uh, last week called the federal program useless. And, and, and the leader of the opposition last week, Mr. Speaker, said Spons? what we want to see is paid sick days in Ontario. Ten paid sick days. Seven. Rather, ten sick days. Seven paid 
And yes, that would be small businesses' responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the government House Leader, almost a year ago, the Premier told Ontarians we need to lock down for two weeks to flatten the curve. Two weeks into, turn into two months for most of the province, turn into almost four months for most of the GTA in my beloved city of Toronto. Four months turn into a year. Flatten the curve, turn into slow the spread. Slow the spread, turn into stop the spread. And now stop the spread, turn into until we all get vaccinated, we should stay home. It's been a year. A year of depression, of economic devastation, a year of missed cancer diagnoses and canceled heart surgeries, a year of children and adults de developing depression and anxiety. My city of Toronto is in ruins. North York is not recognizable. My question to the government house leader, will the narrative become until we address all variants, until we get the Pfizer booster shot, until Moderna adjusts the formula? Question. When will you let us free? What is that parameter? And why should we believe you? Order. The response, the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, uh, of course, remind the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman that of uh, March of last year, he voted in favour of, uh, of lockdown measures. Uh, he did so again in April. He did so again in May. He did so again in June. Uh, he did so, voted in favour of the uh, uh, Reopening Ontario Act in July. Uh, he voted in favour of the measures in September. He voted in favour of those measures in October. He voted in favour of those measures in November. He voted in favour of those member no, those measures uh, in December, Mr. Speaker. So I thank the Honourable Member for the support that he has given to help keep the people of the province of Ontario safe uh, in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. Thank you. The supplementary question? I've not heard a response. I've not heard a response because there is no exit strategy. There never was. The government keeps stumbling and fumbling along, adjusting the narrative to the politics of the day. Governing by opinion polls, as most of the world is already open, a recent UK study concluded that there are already more than 4,000 variants of COVID-19. On January 12, Moderna said that its vaccine is only good for a year. It's an open in Fortune magazine. Pfizer is contemplating a third booster shot. Dr. Steiny Brown, the modeling expert during the February 11th public hearing briefing, uh, public health briefing, called some of the variants potential vaccine SKPs. So why? Why is the government offering an unviable exit strategy again? Just four months more, just till the fall, just until we get the third shot. My question to the government house leader, what is the exit strategy? And will he apologize for the millions of lives ruined by this government? Question. Again, government house leader to respond. Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the, Minister of, uh, the Minister of Health, uh, the Premier, uh, have been uh, very clear on, on what the exit strategy is. is uh, it's to keep the people of the province of Ontario safe and healthy. That is why uh, I am quite proud of the fact that, uh, as the Minister of Health highlighted uh, yesterday, and the Premier, as a matter of fact, uh, highlighted yesterday, that Ontario has done better than almost any other jurisdiction uh, in North America uh, in terms of keeping its people safe. So I I'm quite proud of that, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot of work left to be done. I'll let the honourable gentleman now, who sat with this uh, this government uh, and voted for many, 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 many months on all of the very same measures he somehow now disagrees with, explain that to his constituents. For us, the health and safety of the people of the province of Order. Ontario come first. That's what we're doing. We're putting the resources in place to ensure that that can continue to happen. The Minister of Education Response. has put in place uh, uh, resources to ensure our students are safe. The Minister of Long-Term Care has done that. And the Minister of, uh, of uh, Finance will be uh, uh, highlighting measures to get this economy moving and back on track as soon as possible. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Speaker. On December 5, 2019, the government introduced Bill 159 the Rebuilding Consumer Confidence Act 2019. The bill received royal assent on July 14, 2020. Once in force, it will enable the government to issue administrative penalties against businesses that do not comply with specified provisions of the Consumer Protection Act or its regulations. The Consumer Protection Act is designed to protect consumers from harm when purchasing goods and services in the changing marketplace. The Ministry of Government and Consumer Services is now consulting further on the Consumer Protection Act. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services explain the objective of the current review? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Flamborough Glanbrook for that, that question. She is one of the hardest working MPPs in this House, and your constituents are lucky to have you. Speaker, I want to share with you that our government is conducting its first comprehensive review of the Consumer Protection Act for the first time, as I mentioned, in 15 years. And this is the most comprehensive act that governs and, the, and protects consumers and businesses with regards to how consumers and businesses interact. Specifically, this particular act needs to evolve, and I'm sure everyone in this House will agree to that. Our review of this act specifically is looking at how the act can adapt to changing technology and marketplace innovations, support compliance, and include effective enforcement powers and tools to deter non-compliance. We are looking at how to make the act clearer Response. and easier so consumers and businesses alike can determine their rights and their obligations. All the while, we are continuing to look at how to better protect our vulnerable consumers from practices like aggressive, high-pressure contracts. Thank you. thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Last summer, the Ontario government took action to protect the province's most vulnerable consumers by amending the Payday Loans Act. The government set the maximum interest rate that can be charged on payday loans in default to 2.5%, and the maximum fee that payday lenders can charge for dishonoured payments at $25. The impacts of COVID-19 have made it more important than ever that consumer law be clear to business, avoid imposing undue burdens on companies and entrepreneurs focused on recovery, and stop dishonest competitors from harming consumers and taking business away from honest businesses. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services explain what else the province is doing to protect vulnerable consumers through the Consumer Reporting Act consultations? Mr. Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you to the member from Flamborough Glanbrook. And I, I have to share with you, not only does she take care of her own constituents, but when called upon from people from throughout Hamilton, she readily assists them as well. And so in terms of assisting, our government is committed to protecting consumers and ensuring they have the information they need to make informed decisions when it comes to borrowing money. We are looking to establish new procedures for users with regards to the high-cost alternative financial services like installment loans, lines of credit, and auto title loans provided outside of traditional financial institutions like banks. That is why we are consulting with stakeholders as well as the public to, to identify ways that we can improve the regulation and make available more specific Response. information about these high-cost services so that we can protect, again, our vulnerable borrowers from potential harm. And we will be consulting, and I invite people to look at this particular— Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. Just waiting for my mic to turn on. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Um, Speaker, yesterday, the Minister of Long-Term Care announced that they are finally investing to help train 373 new PSWs for our long-term care sector. While other provinces have already hired and trained thousands of PSWs, in Ontario, there is still no real staffing strategy, and there's definitely no real plan to ensure we address retention and recruitment issues in the sector, like increasing PSW pay. Speaker, through you to the Premier, PSWs deserve a clear answer. Why won't this government commit to increasing pay for frontline workers like our PSWs? Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we know that staffing was long neglected in long-term care, and that's why we've had three approaches to addressing the staffing crisis. It was the emergency response, the stabilization response, and then the longer term. And we had to do all of this simultaneously because the way COVID hit a very uh, at-risk se sector because of the capacity issues that were neglected for so long and the staffing issues. And that's why we made sure that we took every measure to deploy hospital staff. We had matching portals. We had the temporary um, wage uh, increase after the pandemic pay. And we're continuing to make sure that we have a better place to work and a better place to live for our long-term care uh, uh, sector. And, 
This is absolutely important while we have the four hours of, on average, direct Response. care per resident per day, how we build the staffing. Uh, the 373 that were announced the other day are part of a much larger scale, and we'll have more to say about that. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect, this government had almost a whole year to figure out how they were going to address staffing issues in our province. Almost every other province has stepped up by boosting salaries or paying for training. But here in Ontario, thanks to this Conservative government, PSWs are falling further and further behind, and the crisis in long-term care continues to grow. We need you to stop thanking them for their good work and actually put some action into play here. Why won't this government increase PSW's pay and give them the raise that they deserve here in Ontario? Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. So we saw uh, with the, uh, the pandemic pay and then the temporary wage increase, how complicated this area is. And we worked very diligently with other ministries, including the Ministry of Health, to understand when we do something in one area, what its effect is on the rest of the system. This is, it is really important to have this depth of understanding. Order. In Quebec, where more than half of Canada's long-term care deaths have occurred, 86% of the long-term care homes there were publicly funded. And I want to mention that because there's a lot of discussion about how Quebec uh, is doing. And if we actually look at the data, uh, Ontario is doing much better in comparison. And so I think that the comparisons are, are relatively specious. Uh, many long-term care residents are waiting a very long time to receive their vaccine. They're waiting 90 days. We've moved ahead and we've got uh, over 120,000 people vaccinated in long-term care. And so I think this comparison Comparison that's being created with what um, Quebec has done is we've chosen a different approach and our approach is working. Uh, if we look at the rate of attrition of the, of the 10,000 people that they promised to hire, uh, they have, have lost significant numbers and we're not able to hire that many. Very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On Friday, the government made a vaccine announcement that was short on details. In fact, they created another problem by telling people that their family doctors would be responsible for calling them and telling them, their, them about how and when they could get their vaccine. One problem, they didn't tell the doctors. <laughs> so all this caused unnecessary confusion and anxiety for too many Ontario seniors. And then they announced an online booking system that's not ready yet, which is no good to those PHUs where, who are ready to vaccinate people over 80. So, what the Premier announced on Friday was more of an idea than a plan. You know, a plan has specifics, details, targets. You inform the people you're working with about the plan before you announce it. And so, Speaker, through you, when is this government going to release detailed information for seniors over 80 on how to get their vaccine? The Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. The reality is there are going to be 34 plans that are going to be released because each public health unit region is submitting their own plan to the vaccine task force. It's being gone through with the members of the vaccine task force to make sure that it's thorough and complete, and it's going to be a variation depending on what part of Ontario we're looking at, urban versus rural, northern versus southern. Some of the, uh, in some cases, primary care physicians are going to be contacting their patients when the vaccines come in, because I would remind the member, through you, Mr. Speaker, that we are still waiting for vast quantities of vaccines to come in. But in some cases, the physicians will be calling their patients to come into their offices. In other cases, physicians and pharmacists and in some cases, nurses and nurse practitioners will be offering the vaccines in multi-vaccine sites for mass Response. vaccination clinics. So there's a variety of ways that this is going to be done, but there isn't just one plan for the entire province. There are plans that are relative to the local public health unit. That Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Uh, respectfully, Minister, we need a plan. And in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. In December, the Premier told us that we were ready. And what happened over Christmas? Well, the Ford government took a vaccination holiday over Christmas, and then they failed to take the advice of Pfizer and move their vaccine into long-term care homes. So Ontario was at the back of the pack, weeks behind other provinces in getting a first dose into every resident in long-term care. We clearly weren't ready 
as the Premier said, and vaccines didn't get into the arms of those who needed it first. So this can't happen again, Speaker, with over 80s or in phase two, and it feels like it's happening again. So, Speaker, once again, I will ask Question. when will the government release the specific details of the how, when and where all seniors over 80 can receive their vaccine and commit to doing the same thing for phase two of the rollout. Thank you, Speaker. Order. Mr. Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, we have been planning for this for some time. There is a plan that is available, but it's going to be delivered individually in the different public health unit regions. With respect to the vaccines, I'm sure the member is very well aware that we've had delays, significant delays in the delivery of the Pfizer vaccine, as well as the Moderna vaccine, yet We've still been able to change the plans so that we've been able to cover all of the residents of our long-term care homes, at least with the first dose. That is no small feat to do. With respect to the Pfizer vaccine, we were advised, in fact, told by Pfizer we were not to move that vaccine because it could become unstable and perhaps ineffective for use for long-term care residents. We thought about the best way to deal with that. We wanted to make sure that we followed the uh, that we, it would be safe and effective for the people that were being immunized, and that's why the decision Response? was made to make sure that all of the workers could then be immunized. And as soon as the Moderna vaccines became available, which are more movable, they were moved. When Pfizer changed their recommendation and indicated that the, the vaccines could be moved uh, in limited, to limited places. That's what we did. We stepped up immediately to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier of Ontario believe that Conservative Conservative MPPs should be able to threaten communities with funding cuts if they're criticized by the local mayor. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, I'm, I'm quite proud of all of the work that the members on this side of the House have been doing to work with our, uh, our partners at the, municipal, uh, at the municipal level. And indeed, we've uh, been hearing criticism in this House uh, that, uh, that we're working too closely with our federal partners, Mr. Speaker. Ultimately, uh, Speaker, uh, what I expect our members to do, and uh, I assume that they would do it on that side of the House, is fiercely advocate for their communities, fiercely advocate for the things that are important to their constituents. And, uh, and I'm quite confident that Conservative members of uh, provincial parliament do that every Every single day, even when that means working across party lines to do so. The supplementary question. Well, I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that isn't happening in Peterborough. The mayor of Peterborough is fighting back this week after the local Conservative member sent a letter to City Council threatening to pull $6 million in funding away from the municipality. Remember, affordable housing, this funding was for housing, is a crisis in every place in this province. This is not a game and it's not PC money. The mayor quite rightly says pulling funding for homelessness in the middle of a pandemic, and I, I quote her, is wicked and immoral. She went on to say that provincial money is, I quote, not a gift that can be lorded over us and taken away. We agree. So my question to the premier or the house leader again is, does he think it's acceptable that th his MPPs threatened to take away funding just because they don't like being criticized. Do you think that is appropriate behaviour for an MPP to conduct himself in this province? So again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm not fully aware of, uh, of, the, of the issue that uh, the member raises, but uh, I do expect, whether it's the member for Peterborough or any of the members on this side of the House, to fiercely advocate for what's important to them, what's important to their constituents, even if that means once in a while being offside with a partner at a different level of government, Mr. Speaker. Yes, do I think members should work hard to do that? Absolutely, I do. I expect uh, our municipal partners and our federal partners to understand that the pressures that our members and that our government and the people of Ontario are in, in the midst of a, an enormous uh, uh, pandemic, Mr. Speaker. So if the member is asking me, uh, has this government done a lot for, uh, uh, for housing in Peterborough? Yes, absolutely. Has it been the member for Peterborough that has advocated for millions of dollars in different areas of housing in Peterborough? Yes, absolutely. Should that member and any member of this House on either side of the House strenuously advocate, even if it means disagreeing with a member uh, of, a, of a council or a federal member of parliament? Yes, Response? do what you're elected to do. That is, represent the people of the province of Ontario as vigorously as you can, and we won't apologize for doing that. 
The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government has a clear track record of backroom deals. Time and again, decisions are, decisions are made in secret to the benefit of the Premier's friends, while the people of Ontario are left in the dark. Before the Christmas break, we saw this government push through legislation that would allow a well-known bigot to get university accreditation for his college. And now we're learning of another secret deal to sell Toronto's Dominion foundries after months of closed-door negotiations. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to know who's won this government's game of let's make a deal. Will, will the government— So I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Uh, I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Place his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the government tell us who is getting this sweetheart secret deal? The member for Milton. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to thank the member opposite for the question. And once again, uh, I will remind all members in this House, Mr. Speaker, one more time that the site has not been sold. I'm not really sure what the member opposite is talking about, but I would say the government in this case, Mr. Speaker, is leveraging a vacant provincially owned property to build a new affordable housing and community space. Our government has completed a heritage impact assessment for the site and it determined that the building requires demolition to allow for environmental remediation. Speaker, it's astonishing that the members opposite continue to stand against environmental remediation in this case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental is also uh, for the Premier. We've heard time and, again, time and again in this House that the government wants to defend the proper use uh, of process, Mr. Speaker, and they never miss an opportunity to preach about transparency and accountability, and yet they rarely practice it themselves. The government, once again, has refused to disclose who is getting this backroom deal here in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, and the Premier's decision the Premier's Order. decision to use the cup. Stop the clock. Minister of Education must rise in his place and withdraw. Start the clock. The member can place his question. Once again, the government has refused to disclose who is getting the secret deal here in Toronto. The Premier's decision to use the cover of a pandemic to ram through a deal to demolish and sell Dominion Foundries is completely unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier practice what he preaches and commit that any future sale of this land or the development rights on it will be made at market value in a clear and transparent way for the benefit of Ontario taxpayers? And the reply, again, the member for Milton. Well, thank you assistant. very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've been clear. Only the negotiating mandate to facilitate the future sale of the site has been approved, and the site has not been sold. I can continue to stand here again and again, Mr. Speaker, and let the members know again and again in case they have a hard time understanding. I'm happy to stick around after question period and also help them understand the site has not been sold, Mr. Speaker. We are currently consulting with the community to hear more from them. We've also had ongoing conversation with Mayor Tory and the ministry staff is having ongoing conversations with the city staff, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to completing our public consultation and moving forward with the environmental remediation of this site. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I recently met with local officials and restaurant owners in St. Catharines to talk about the need for more sector-based support. They have a point. CFIB described Ontario as having the worst support for small businesses in the country. The owner and chef of Dispatch in St. Catharines, Adam Haynam Smith, says the injections from the grants are not enough and expects to run 2021 at a loss. The Premier knows Niagara and St. Catharines is a tourist and restaurant destination. Losing our restaurants means losing our main streets. Will the Premier stand up and hear the cries for help? And will he immediately announce more emergency funding for hard-hit sectors that will help them weather the storm 
during a third wave. May the parliamentary assistant, member for Willoughby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member raising these important issues because we recognize the hospitality sector, the tourism sector, has been one of the hardest hit. Uh, uh, areas of business in this province, and that's why, Speaker, from the very beginning, we have outlined a series of supports. I mean, the most recent one we uh, talk about just yesterday was the Small Business Support Grant Program, which allows for a grant of up to $20,000 for these hard-hit restaurants, for these hard-hit tour operators, Speaker. And I'm proud to say that even since yesterday, the funding that has reached the hands of many of these businesses, even in St. Catharines, is now up to $930 million. Dollars, Speaker. That's over 66,000 businesses who have received funds in hand. However, we recognize, of course, that this is a very serious pandemic that will have long-lasting economic uh, uh, effects, and that's why we've outlined also a series of permanent tax reductions, whether that is property tax coming down up to 30 percent or EHT, a tax on jobs that has been permanently eliminated for the smallest of small businesses, Speaker, a series of measures for Fun. today and for tomorrow so that we can indeed weather the storm. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Adam ended our meeting by saying that he had to go lay off another staff member. Other restaurant groups at the meeting had already laid off all of their staff. Niagara is in grey, and these businesses just want to open their doors, but they can't unless it's safe. Our chief medical officer cited low vaccine supply for Niagara's continued lockdown. He said to avoid to avoid the third wave, it is a race for vaccination. But Niagara has not got their fair share of vaccines to justify a safer reopening. In fact, Premier, you diverted 5,500 5, Moderna vaccines to somewhere else. Will the Premier stand up and tell small businesses across Niagara and in St. Catharines why Ontario with its worst small business support in the country, won't do more to help businesses through a lockdown Question. while it does not provide its fair share to St. Catharines. Deputy Premier and Minister Hart. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I thank the member for the question. But uh, what I can assure the member through you, Mr. Speaker, is that Niagara has received its fair share of vaccines. In fact, in some cases, overly so. The, the, their vaccines were sufficient to vaccinate all of the residents of the long-term care homes. The vaccines, we had to reship some of the vaccines because of the significant reduction in supply of vaccines that we've received through the federal government via Pfizer and, and uh, Moderna. But there were sufficient vaccines delivered to Niagara to make sure that all of the residents of the long-term care homes were given at least the first injection, and then we will continue with that. We have a, a priority, a phase priority of people to receive the vaccines, but I can assure the member opposite that Niagara did receive their fair share. Absolutely. Thank you. That concludes our question period this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.